Well, good morning. Good morning. This is the Pastor Mike Erickson bringing you the word of the Lord from Big Bear Four Square Church. We're glad to have the body of Christ assembled here today, and we're so appreciative that we can come together. The church is not anything without the body of people, right? And so when the church is healthy, the body of people are gathered together, and we look forward to that in our future. A couple of things in our bulletin that I'd like to give to the local body. First of all, Sunday, December 5th, and I hope every one of you has a bulletin this morning, uh, Evangelist Steve Warford will be with us to preach the word of the Lord. Uh, he's also got a new book out on miracles, and, and we're going to promote that before and after, but uh, also that time he's going to bring the word of the Lord, pre uh, pray for people, and we've seen a lot of miracles happen throughout the years with Pastor, with Evangelist D. Warford being with us. So he's going to be with us Sunday morning, December 5th. A little closer, Wednesday night before Thanksgiving will be uh, canceled. That night will be canceled because of the activities of Thanksgiving week. And so that's two announcements about the schedules. Once you turn to the word of the Lord to 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 17 through 25, talking today a message called, This is How We Need to Live. Let's pray. Father God, I pray that you would please touch us with your word today. Help us to focus on your word. Help us to be centered on your word. Help us to receive from your word today, hear your voice in it, and Lord, be touched today. I pray, Lord, that you would help me to preach your word with power and authority so that everyone who hears this word today will be blessed, encouraged, and ministered to. In Jesus' name, amen. This is how we need to live. I imagine that there will be a lot of people standing before God that don't know him. And... What a horrifying place and position to be in for those standing before God and not knowing him. But if I take from our society and from people in general who do not know the Lord, I can imagine this response. Who are you to judge me? What, right, what, what gives you the right to judge me? And feeling that, the echoing the sentiments here on earth before the throne of God himself. As I was going through the word this, this morning, uh, not only this morning but this week, I've had some pastors tell me that people have been saying that we have no right to tell people how to live. And I say, well, we have the right to preach the word of God that tells us how to live. And so many times people only turn to the Bible, the word of God, during a service, during a time of preaching. And I want to encourage everyone to be in the word so that God's voice can speak to you about your life personally. Beginning with verse 17, he says, And remember that the Heavenly Father to whom you pray 
has no favorites. What does that mean? He's able to take you one at a time. No comparisons. And the only one that you'll be compared to is the Lord Jesus himself who covers you with his blood and makes everything for you even ground. Talk about favorites. Uh, look at the book of Romans with the concordance and look at James chapter 2 where it says God does not judge people in the sense of preferring and showing favoritism. He will judge or reward you according to what you do. And this is really important for us as Christians to understand this. It starts with what we believe. It starts with our heart. It starts with the confession of faith. And all those things are proven by what we do and how we live, how we treat people, how we walk, by the fact that how we live our life is really proof of what, what we believe. So having said that, so you must live in reverent fear of him during your time here as temporary residents. It's good to have a, a fear of God. Jesus told us that don't fear him who can just kill the body. Well, that's, that's fear enough, right? I mean, somebody stands before you with a gun or intent to kill you. I mean, you're going to have ample fear for the moment. But by comparison, fear him who can destroy both body and soul in hell. Hell being the ultimate, uh, the ultimate horror that no horror on earth has ever been realized as more severe than eternal hell. So live in reverent fear. Should we fear God? Absolutely. Should we have reverence for God? Absolutely. And I say this quite often, but in the Chronicles of Narnia, where I think the little girl was asking Thomas, who's part goat, whatever, and they said she sees Aslan coming, and she, and she says, is he loving? Is he loving? And she, he says, oh, yes. Is he good? Oh, yes. Can I pet him? Can I pet Aslan the lion? No, you can't pet him. He's not tame. Yeah. And so we can't be so casual with God that we feel like he's tame in that sense. Very profound message in that. He's our great loving lion, but we can't pet him because he's not tame. Okay. Does God love you? Absolutely. My whole point is that we don't take him for granted and we know and fear who he is and he's by nature Omnipotent, all-powerful, omniscient, all-knowing, omnibenevolent, all-loving, and omnipresent. You are temporary residents here on Earth. I think the thing that will make our lives as Christians easier, in a sense, is realizing that this world, this place, is not our home. 
We don't live from here. About 30 years ago, I, or more, I was going to take a part-time job at the uh, Stowe Summit, and I applied in the summer. And I had an interview with one of the bosses there, and he says, well, before you sign up with, you, with us, you have to know that you have to live for Snow Summit. You have to live for us. This job is nothing more important in your life than this job. And I told him, I said, well, we don't need to interview any further because I got two little girls and I live for them and I love the Lord and I live for him. And I got, I, I'm choosing to work so I can live. I don't choose to live so I can work. And I said, so I'll, I'll see you. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but that's the first thing he says. If you want to work for me, you got to live for this job. Okay, doesn't work for me. But the scripture is telling us also that if we really want to live, we're not going to live for this world. Right? I've had the privilege of ministering in 11 nations. And one of the things that I realize in every one of those nations when I go to preach or go to do anything is that I'm not a resident here. This is not my country. I represent another country in another place. And I am intently a, and understandingly a, a foreigner who is free to preach the word in some cases. And we have to realize that the United States is our natural country. I get that. But we belong to the kingdom of God first. And we have to realize, like Abraham, like Isaac and Jacob, like those that they were, it was said of Abraham in Hebrews 11, they were looking for uh, the maker, God, for a city that he would make without hands, right? And we are foreigners in this land. We don't belong here. Imagination, get it going a little bit to a baby in the womb might be comfortable for nine months, right? But there comes a time where it's not going to be comfortable to be here any longer. So baby kicks and screams to come out in this world. I don't blame them. But a lot of times we're going to be birthed, understand we're going to be birthed into heaven, into the kingdom of God. We're not going to go, some of us might go kick, kicking and screaming, but we're really preparing this life to go into that one that will be eternal for us. Verse 18, for you know that God paid a ransom to save you from the empty life that you inherited from your ancestors. I want to center in on the word ransom and go back and tell you about the Passover of Seder for a minute. How many of you have been to a Passover of Seder? It's a great experience. Well, at the beginning of the presentation of the meal, there are three whole matzahs representing the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And the middle matzah is broken. The middle one, we think that's like Jesus, broken. And the bigger piece is wrapped in a linen cloth 
and set aside. And that's called the afikomen. And that bigger piece is called the afikomen, which means until later. So later on in the meal, one of the children at the table steals the afikomen, the larger part, knowing that the father cannot complete the Seder dinner without the afikomen. So he steals it. And then when the father says, uh, look who took the afikomen, uh, the child says, I, I got it, but it's going to cost you a ransom. So it, whatever the, the father has agreed, I'll give you $10 for the afikomen, whatever it is. So the father pays to the child at the table a ransom to get the afikomen back so that the service can be completed. It's a wonderful picture of Christ's ransom for us. He paid the price, right? A ransom to save you from the empty life that you inherited from your ancestors. And it was not paid with mere gold or silver, which lose their value. It was the precious blood of Christ, the sinless, spotless Lamb of God. Jesus never committed any sin in his earthly life. Matter of fact, never before or since or after, perfectly sinless and holy. I don't know how this statistic can be true, but as polling it says that 47% of born-again Christians believe that Jesus sometime in his life committed sin. You can't be a born-again Christian and believe that Jesus had sometime committed sin. He committed sin, no sin, no sin at all. He, he who knew no sin became a sin offering for us. We are purchased with the precious blood of Jesus that we celebrated in communion today. And identifying with the blood of, uh, blood of Christ that flows through our spiritual veins that's redeemed us because the Father paid the ransom through the blood of Christ for our redemption. Long before the world began, but now in these last days he has been revealed for your sake. We are in the last days Whether we are or not for sure, you have to live like you are because the scripture is very intent on us understanding that we must live for him and completely for him in the last days. Through Christ in verse 21, you have come to trust in God. If you know Jesus Christ is your Savior and you love the Lord, you need to trust him for every single part of your life. We trust him. What's the word trust mean? It means to have faith in, to rely upon. And you have placed your faith and hope in God because he, he raised Christ from the dead and gave him great glory. We have the blood of Jesus on the cross, shed for us on the cross, but all of that was proven to be true through the resurrection of Jesus. Romans 1.4 talks about 
the power that raised him from the dead. It was because of the resurrection that the Lord's brothers Jude and James became believers. It was because of the resurrection that many uh, who knew him before actually came to realize who they had among the, them for all that time. For after the resurrection, you have the ascension of Jesus into heaven, and then you have 120 waiting for the Holy Spirit to come in the upper room in Acts chapter 2. After that, the church exploded because of who Jesus is and what he's done and how it's been proved to the resurrection and his involvement with even us today. We love him because he's displayed that love to us. We serve him because of the reality of him in our lives. Every one of us can say, God has been not only real to me, but ever present for me every day. You know, I, I praise the Lord and thank the Lord that he's in the tangibles, things that I can physically see. He's in the intangibles, the things that, uh, that I can't see or understand. He's all, in every dimension. He works around those or those around me, he works those things in me. He speaks to me through his word, his voice personally. He speaks to me through people in the body of Christ. The reality of God is very apparent to me every day. So verse 22, you were cleansed from your sins when you obeyed the truth. The Hebrew concept of faith means you obey the word and voice of God. Why? Because in your obeying the voice of God, you are saying, I know by faith that God has spoken to me. And I need to respond in obedience. So now you must show sincere love for, to each other as brothers and sisters. Love each other deeply with all of your heart. What's that look like? How do I love people? 1 Corinthians 13 is a good basis to start. The fruit of the Spirit, Galatians 5, 22 and 23 is a good place to start. Kindness is huge with the word and with the heart of people being kind. We can share with people and talk to people and treat people as if understanding Christ and how he would respond and help and minister to people as well. Love each other deeply with all your heart. That can involve affection, it can involve sympathy, compassion, all the things, empathy, walking with them and through things with them as well. For you've been born again. Do you have a story to tell? When did that happen? What happened when you were born again? When your life was transformed? How, is, how was it before? How is it different now? Can you say, I'm born again by the Spirit of God because of these things. My life is different than it was. If you claim to be born again and everything's the same as it was, well, you might want to revisit that. Correct? Mm -hmm. 
and say, you know what, I've been a Christian a long time and my life's never been any different. Well, you might want to come back to the foot of the cross and find born again experience. And if you've been born again, you might want to rededicate your life to the Lord so that you can walk in newness of life. For you've been born again not to a life that will quickly end. Your new life will last forever because it comes from the eternal living word of God. Amen. From the day you got saved throughout eternity, that's when your spirit Spiritual, eternal life started is when you got born again. It doesn't start when you go to heaven. That's going to be a different dimension. But it's still in the transition. It starts now who we are in Christ. Verse 24 it says, As the scriptures say, people are like grass. And their beauty is like a flower in the field. The grass withers and the flower fades. If you're anything like me, you understand and know that as long as you lived up to this point, it seems like it's gone by really fast. It seems like a vapor. Like the scripture says, uh, a f f flower fading. Uh, but verse 25, but the word of the Lord remains forever. And that word is the good news that was preached to you and preached to you today. A couple weeks ago, I challenged you to read the New Testament through this fall. How many of you are doing that? Okay. All right. Now I can say you can finish the four Gospels between now and the end of the year. Uh, try that. Whatever we can do to get you in the Word. Uh, is really because once the word is in us, then the word can grow and be fruitful in us and do its work. And uh, if you want a little bit of work, a little bit of growth, a little bit of this, then a little bit will be what you're doing with the word. But if you want a lot, more add more word to it so that God has something to use in your life to transform you. You might sit down and read uh, a chapter and in that chapter God might speak to you clearly a rhema and you had a great time with the Lord. Sometimes you have to read more. Sometimes you have to Give yourself more to the word to come to that point. But I pray today that you find yourself in the word, changed by the word, growing through the word, so that his word can do with, with you and for you everything that God desires. Let's pray. Father, I pray that this word today really touch your people's hearts. Help us, Lord, to read your word. Lord, if it's possible, I pray those that uh, need to start will read the Gospels before the end of the year. Lord, I pray that you would equip your body with everything they need for life and godliness. And we thank you, Lord, for the ransom that was paid through the blood of Jesus to cover us and cleanse us from all of our sin. Lord, I thank you today and I praise you and thank you for your grace. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.